Presented by Caltech. Okay, so that's on the logistics part. Any questions about all this stuff? What course is this? Why am I here? Anything? All with me? Okay, so right off the bat, I want to clear some things out. Be very, very straightforward about what this course is going to be about. I don't want to bring expectations too high. The next 10 weeks is not going to be about learning any new law of nature. Boo. <laughs> no, boos, okay. So there will be no new law of nature in the next 10 weeks. We will only be focusing on Newton's laws, just F equals MA. That's it. And you learned that stuff last year, right? Just one year ago in Phys 1, all of you are experts in Newton's laws. You learned it much recently than I did. To give you a sense of like how old I am now, I think I learned Newton's laws when I think Obama was in his first term of the White House. That was a whole different time altogether then. So the point being, it's only going to be Newton's laws, OK? So you might wonder as to why are we having a full course on this weird, boring topic called oscillations and waves. Why is it even required to teach you about this stuff once you know how nature works at the very basic level? And I want to convince you today that it's not that bad. Oscillations and waves typically really, really importantly make up the world we live in. So to give you a sense of how that is, let's just think about different possible scales in nature, right? So let's think about starting from all the way from the quantum sizes, from the microscopic, all the way to the macroscopic scales, okay? So some characteristic size of the system. I'm going to label three different regimes. I'm going to call this the microscopic. This could be the everyday classical uh, reality that we live in. And for the lack of a better term, I'm going to call this astronomical. So just think across the spectrum. Where do you imagine oscillations and waves really pop up in nature? What's the first thing which comes to mind? Just keep keep prompting, keep keep saying stuff. This has got to be more interactive. We've got to speak up more. So swing. Excellent, yeah. That reminds me of my childhood. Thank you. Swings. You go back and forth. What else? What natural phenomena is intrinsically tied to stuff oscillating back and forth? Springs. Springs. So every mechanical object, somehow or the other. So all mechanical objects have oscillations in them. Yeah. Sound. Excellent. Sound. The reason I can speak with you, you can hear me, is because there are these oscillations in the air propagating through. And we're learning this stuff in this course as we go along. There have more prompts? Yeah? Light. Light. Excellent. Electromagnetic waves. This thing, of course, expands the whole spectrum in a certain way. But us seeing each other, um, ultraviolet, infrared, radio, everything we know and love is because that is oscillation. And EM waves will be a major topic in the course, following like week five or something. So we focus on that. So that's like a big part of who we are. And electromagnetic force is one of the fundamental forces of nature. And if that kind of gives you a phenomenon of oscillations in waves, I think it's pretty reasonable to have a course based on that. What else? Orbits of planets. Orbits of planets on the astronomical side. So orbits. Planets go around, they rotate, they revolve, a bunch of cool stuff. That, that's oscillations, that's periodic stuff. Yeah. Molecular bonds. Molecular bonds. On the microscopic. So molecular bonds. Just to add to that, um, there'll be vibrations of these bonds. And these vibrations is basically what leads to life the way we know it in a certain sense. All the excitement that happens at the microscopic level it's because there is this dynamism in the microscopic structure of the universe. And we can describe, you know, the hydrogen atom, any, uh, any two pairs of molecules or cells or whatever put together by forces interacting, they always oscillate in a certain way and give rise to good things. Uh, what else? Yeah. Instruments. Instruments like, uh, like music instruments? Excellent. Music. We can look at that, right? That's it. Pretty important to have. And of course, um, somewhere in the middle of the course, we also talk about how guitar strings oscillate, how they produce sound, 
what's the connection with the underlying you know, physics of the whole thing. I might add some more around here. Um, you could think about things like gravitation waves, right? They were waves in the ripples of space and time itself. So those go all the way up here, maybe. So gravitation waves. Our heartbeats, everything that we know and love is somehow oscillations and waves at some level or the other. Neurons firing, everything has that, has that feature in there. So this kind of like gives you a sense as to spanning the whole spectrum, the applications of Newton's laws to this phenomenon of oscillations and waves is pretty darn important. So like 10 weeks is, I guess, less to spend on this. And I'll say a bit more on this idea. Okay, one thing. So for today, we want to keep it light and simple. Not too much math. Just kind of get into the hang of the whole thing. And then as we go along, we keep building stuff up. Um, I should also mention that when you say the word oscillation, in physics, you often mean the word simple harmonic motion. Just simple pendulum-like motion, simple springs. And that might sound very naive. Like, why is this simple equation of f equals ma with a simple spring? Why is that important? And the blunt answer to that is that that's all we know how to solve. That's the truth. We don't know anything else as physicists, to be honest. We just keep working with the simple harmonic oscillator in more and more abstract degrees of freedom as we go along. Quantum mechanically, when you think about the oscillator in a quantum mechanical perspective, which if you take physics to B next term, you learn about all that cool stuff, but that's probably the most important solvable system that we can solve. Nothing else is really solvable in the way that we would like it to be. And what we do is we can solve the simple harmonic oscillator and then we build up on top of that to realize nature. This Feynman diagram out here, which you look uh, to, your, to your left, this is nothing but a harmonic oscillator with small corrections on top of that, small perturbations. So quantum electrodynamics, quantum field theory, it's all about oscillators. Even quantum gravity are kind of, you know, end, game, end goal of the game, how do you combine the microscopic quantum mechanical laws with the laws of gravity, oscillators play a very important role. And most of my like personal research work also focuses on just using oscillators all the time. So once you like know this stuff, you're good to go in a certain sense. Okay? And um, so it's, it's pretty darn important, and we talk more about this. I also just like this like reminds me of the fact that over the summer I was visiting a friend in, in Urbana Champagne, and he's a civil engineer. He does like earthquake engineering predictions, stuff like that. So what they do is they do a probabilistic understanding of different phenomena. And all they also solve is just the harmonic case, just the Gaussian case, as they would call it. And as physicists, we had developed a whole toolkit which could go slightly beyond the, the harmonic case. And we just used all this physics knowledge in quantum field theory to civil systems in earthquake prediction. And it worked pretty well. So as long as you know this stuff, your hands really wide and wide. So it's pretty all-encompassing in that sense. Okay, so that's me like blabbering about why it's important, but more technically, I'll give you two reasons: a, a more physics side of things and a more mathematical side of things. So on the more physics front, let's go back to Phys One A. So think about conservative forces. That name ring a bell? Somewhat, right? Yeah, okay. So conservative forces are those for which the work done by that force doesn't depend on the path that you actually take to move the particle around. That's probably you know, the few things in life which goes against what you have in everyday life. The ends don't justify the means, but uh, in this case, the ends are all that matters. So the total work done by a force in a closed loop F is the force, dot dr, over small displacements, the work done, if you add it all up, this is zero. Why? Because it's a closed loop. You start from a point, you take any possible path, come back to the point, the net work done is zero. And this holds for two of our favorite forces, right? The gravitational force. Of course, gravity is not a force in the sense in which how Einstein taught us, but at least, you know, for 
undergrad, sophomore, junior level, it's a force. Okay? So gravitational force is conservative. Electro, electric, electrostatic forces are also conservative. So charges attracting, repelling, masses falling to the earth, everything is conservative. It doesn't matter what path you take. All it matters is where you start and where you end. Okay? So if you remember for these kind of forces, you can always describe the physics by a potential energy function. There is some energy to space, to how the configurations are. So let's take one dimension for now. It's nice and good, simple word. So let's have some potential energy function u of x. Any arbitrary function. So this is a function of x. Say it looks like that. Okay. That's the energy of configurations as you move the particle in one dimension. Okay. Now let's just try and look at what happens around this particular point. Let's call this point x naught. Okay. And this shape again I mentioned is arbitrary, so it could be any possible shape. And x naught is one of the possible local minimas of this potential energy curve. So this is a local minima. And by virtue of it being a local minima, the energy around this point is minimized. If energy is the least, it's the most stable at that point, right? So this is the point of an equilibrium, this local minima point. This should, this should look familiar, I'm hoping so. Now what I can do is, very, very generally, I can expand out my function u of x about the point x naught. Just do a simple Taylor expansion about the point x naught. So there is a constant, which is the value of u at the point x naught. Then I have the first derivative term, which is plus du dx at the point x naught. So this is a number. It's the, it's the differential of this whole u of x function with respect to x evaluated at the point x naught times x minus x naught. Let's go down, plus 1 over 2 factorial, the second derivative of u with x at the point x naught times x minus x naught whole squared, plus the third term, 1 over 3 factorial, d cube u over dx cube at the point x naught, x minus x naught to the third. And if I have infinite amount of time, I can keep on going this way and keep adding more and more. I just expanded out the function u of x about the point x naught. That's all I did. Okay? And again, these are all numbers. du dx at x naught is a number at that point. Second derivative at that point. Third at that point, so on and so forth. Okay? So out here, it, it's most generic. There is nothing, there is no approximation, there is no nothing yet. That's just it. Okay? So we have that. So once I have u of x, how do I get the force on the particle from the u of x? The force acting on the particle, can someone remind me? You guys are much more recent than this. Given the u of x, how do you get the force? Should ring a bell. Think about gravity, right? If I have a particle at a height h, what's the, and a mass m, what's the energy? It's MGH, right? What's the force? MG. It's just a factor of H which was differing. Does that take you down the memory road? The force is acting on a particle in a potential energy field is just the negative of the differential of the potential with respect to that coordinate. Okay? And since these are like partial differentials, you're working in one dimension. So this just this, this is this is working in 1D, this is just minus du of x over dx. That's the force. You have the potential energy, you differentiate it, you get the forces at every point in space. Okay? So we have a function, we learn calculus, we can do this. Okay? So what's f of x? Minus the differential of u of x. The first term, u at x naught, what's the ddx of that? Zero. It's a constant. It's a, it's a number at that point, so that but that vanishes. It's nothing from that. The second term, what do you get? 
So there are these two terms, du dx at x0 times x minus x0. I think the chain rule here. Once I differentiate du dx with again x, what do I get? Think about this. So this is just a number, okay? And differential of a number is zero. So this is not a function in the usual sense. This is a number now because it's at the point x0. So the first derivative of the u function is just minus du dx at the point x0, which is just a number. And that's it. Okay? Second term. Go to the piece which has a square in the potential. So I have a minus coming in from the definition of the, of the force, 1 over 2 factorial. Again, I have a number, which is d squared u over dx, dx squared, at the point x0, times x minus x0 whole squared, differentiate that, I get 2 times x minus x0, and so on and so forth, minus 1 over 3 factorial. Again, a number, d cube u, dx cube, and x0. 3 times x minus x0 whole squared, plus yada yada yada. Is that okay with everyone? Any, any questions about this? People often like get a little confused about how do you go from here to there, what about these, these differentials, they are numbers, okay, because it's a, it's a, it's a property of the, of the curve itself. Okay, so we have a bunch of terms, let's try and see what they are. What about this one? du dx at the point x0. Zero. Zero. Heads up, whenever I ask questions in class to prompt up, the answer is going to be either zero, infinity, or one. <laughs> so you have a decent chance of being able to write it. Okay, so zero, the first term. Any justification for that? Which just cause? Even lucky today. It's an equilibrium. Look at the pressure energy curve at the point x0. The first derivative, the tangent at that point, is horizontal. If it's that wasn't too horizontal, but you know what I mean. At that point, the derivative is 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 flat, and the fact that there is no force acting at that point, which is the statement. So this point, the x naught, is an equilibrium point, as we already knew. Equilibrium. And what do you have? You have minus. Um, minus d squared u over dx squared at x0 times x minus x0 um, minus 1 half d cube u over dx cube at the point x0 times x minus x0 squared plus so on and so forth. Again, till now, this series is exact. It's exact because I put these dot, dot, dot. Everything is there. I haven't truncated anything out yet. It's exact stuff so far, okay? So that's my, that's my force equation. I have a force which depends on the, the displacement over the equilibrium point to first order, to second order, to third order, and so on and so forth, okay? All right. Now say if I want to look at displacements which are small. Now that's a choice. Now I'm restricting my purview. Everything so far has been generic, no assumptions, but now I am focusing on the case where x minus x naught is much, much less than one. In the right units, of course, in the right x naught uh, scaling. But all these terms are small then. And when this is small, what I mean by the fact is that I'm looking for physics about this point. So for small deviations about the equilibrium. And in that case, when you have a number smaller than one, you take its higher powers, it becomes smaller and smaller. Hence, all these higher order contributions become less and less important. And I can be very brave and truncate my series only at this order. This is an approximation which is only valid for small deviations from the equilibrium. And in that case, f of x is approximately, now the approximate thing comes in, minus d squared u dx squared at the point x0 times x minus x0, and the potential energy function u of x, 
which piece contributed? The first term is just a constant. So I have it here. This is u of x naught. The second term vanishes because, again, the derivative was 0 by the equilibrium condition. And I'm truncating it at this order, right? So the potential energy is this plus 1 half d square u dx square at x naught times x minus x naught squared. So this is the harmonic approximation. I should have probably gone over there quick. Okay, you get the point. Once I truncate my series only till the quadratic order in the potential and hence a linear order in the force, that's my harmonic approximation. <laughs> and just to mention, kind of going to close the loop here, say if I had taken one more term or two more terms or whatever, had I taken these and harmonic terms in my series and then tried to work it out, this Feynman diagram here, if you look at this vertex, this like three point, these three and many together, this three point thing is that first anharmonic term contributing to interactions of an electron with a photon. Okay? So that's all that is. Just keep adding more terms, find a way of solving it, and you win the Nobel Prize. It's that easy, okay? That's no, not. <laughs> it, it, it's, this is hard stuff to be honest, but um, anyways. So this still might not look very familiar. Let me massage it a little bit more. Let me call, let me define, or label or whatever, d squared u over dx squared at the point x naught as k. I'm a lazy person. Derivatives are hard to write all the time. I'm going to call that k. It's a number, right? Because it's a number, it depends on the curve that you've chosen and the choice of the minima x naught. You choose the, the point x naught, you choose the curve u of x, that's a number, okay? That's implying k. In that language, f of x minus k times x minus x naught, u of x, u naught, uh, uh, u of x naught, plus one half k x minus x naught squared. Again, the approximations, in the harmonic approximation, now this should look familiar. Simple harmonic motion. Now what that says is, you might say, that was just math. What did I learn here? Like what's the underlying physical reality? The point is that, do I have colored chalk? Probably not, but that's fine. Um, the reality is that for any arbitrary shape potential about a minimum, for small displacements, you can approximate it as a parabolic curve. Okay? Think about it. Any, any function, any curve around the local point of minima, it could look weird. It could look like, you know, like that. But that's not a parabola in any case. But I could approximate stuff around this point as an approximate parabolic thing. So for small displacements, the two curves match up very, very well. And that's what we're doing. As long as you're okay with small displacements, you can approximate the potential as a parabolic approximation about that one. Okay. So that's that. Now, two more little comments about things. I can always call x naught as zero. Right? Any qualms? Anyone has any issues with that? It's just a choice of coordinate system, right? Instead of looking at you like this, I can look at you like that. And I can call that zero. I can move. It's a choice of the observer, the person, the device who is doing the experiment, and it's just a choice of the coordinates. And physics, as much as we know so far, is independent of the choice of the coordinate system. Even Galileo told, taught this to us. And this like, went all the way to Einstein as well. His ideas of gravity, relativity, that picture at the back uh, with the warp space-time. Einstein's idea was the fact that physics should be completely independent of the choice of the reference frame. And when you work out the full math in all its glory, you get Einstein's theory of gravity out of it. 
It's, it's pretty sweet stuff. So I can always choose this to be zero. And again, I can always choose u at that point x naught to be zero. Thoughts about why that is true? Gotta speak up. Uh, but why could it be zero? It's arbitrary because, at least for physics that we know, without gravity, that's a little you know conditions apply star. Gravity is a little wonky when it comes to energies, and I can talk about that forever if you want me to. But let's not tie this on the path. But um, at least for the physics that we know and love, all that matters is energy differences. There is no absolute scale of energy. I can always shift everything by a certain number. Physically, what matters is energy differences. So as long as I shift everything by a constant, who cares? Okay. So call that constant in my equations as zero. Makes life simpler for me. Okay. And I'm a simple person, so let's keep it that way. So in that sense, this is just minus kx. That's one half k x squared, and so on. Okay. So let's just look at two curves. Let's say I have as a function of uh, as a function of x. This is one of my curves, and this is the other curve. This corresponds to k1. This corresponds to k2. Notice one thing before you. I have not used the word spring even once. I mean, now I just did, but before that I did not. I did not use the word spring anywhere, and I got the spring equation. And argued in the sense that this is true, this is important to physics as a whole. Just potential energies for forces like gravity, electromagnetism, things like that, these are important things. Okay? I didn't use the word spring. But in this language, if I have two such curves, so two different systems, and say there were springs now, which is a tighter spring, which is, is more tight, you know, which kind of gives you more force for the same displacement. K1 or K2, which is a tighter spring? K1. K1, right? Because K1 has a what is K? K is the curvature of the of the U of X curve. K1 is more curved than K2. And the spring one is 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 tighter. I don't know what the other right mechanical word for that is, but please bear with me. I'm a theoretical physicist. So that's it. Okay? So just by the properties of the potential curve, you can get a bunch of things going on for you. Okay, now the more cool stuff is not just the fact that we can work the data expansion out, it's the fact that we can actually solve this equation, exactly. So I have f of x, <coughs> Newton said f of x, the force, by the second law is just mx double dot, the dot on the x is the time derivative, so this is just m d squared x over dt squared. So, second law, once you specify the functional form of f of x, you go ahead, solve it, you can get the trajectory of the particle. So you solve this, you get x as a function of time, and you know how the particle is between around space and time. Okay? So let's do that. So f of x, I know the form for the harmonic approximation. So mx double dot is minus k times x. Again, this is standard stuff. I'm going to go quickly over this. So x double dot, which is e squared x over e squared, is minus k over m times x again. I'm going to call this minus omega squared times x, where omega is squared into k over m. Call the natural frequency of the system. I'm sure everyone's seen this before, so that that's fine. OK. Now, people often ask me, and I asked this myself when I was your age, Fine, I have an equation. How do I solve this? And everyone would just say, you know the answer. Right? And that's what I'm going to say to you as well. <laughs> there is no justification, at least at this level of the course. But just think a little bit more intuitively. What function, when differentiated twice, gives you something proportional to the same function itself? Sines and cosines. Sine gives cos, cos gives sine, right? So you do it twice, get the same thing back again. <coughs> so for now, we're going to get, be convinced that that's the solution that we know. Of course, if you get a little bit more advanced, you can 
trace back the origins of the solutions back to you know, hypergeometric functions and a bunch of cool stuff in math. But for now, we're going to keep our lives nice and good. The solution for this, x of t, is some a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. And I can, of course, combine the sines and cosines into some other constant which was a tilde times cosine omega t minus some phase angle phi. So that's my solution to these equations. Now, here's the, again the, the physics crucial key point that you must like understand behind uh, these things. It's the fact that there are these two unknown constants, either called an a or b, or called an a tilde and phi. I can of course like rewrite a tilde in terms of a and b, and phi in terms of a and b, and vice versa. But these are these two unknowns that I have in my equation. And I should because it's a second order differential equation. They're two derivatives, hence there must be two unknowns, two constants of integration. And these two can be fixed by specifying initial conditions. If I tell you at some time, let's say t naught, so I choose a time, I say, okay, this is time t naught. I go and see the particle. I know what that value is. If I specify this to you, where the particle is, and how fast it's moving, x dot at t naught. If I give you where the particle is and its velocity, you can use these to determine all the unknown constants. Okay? Now this might seem a trivial statement about math or just differential equations, but this goes to the heart of what classical physics actually is. Anyone hear of the of the of the concept of Laplace's demon? No? So uh, Pierre Simon Laplace, he was French uh, philosopher, mathematician, cool dude back in the day. And he had this idea about how classical mechanics works. So he thought that, okay, we as humans are limited in our knowledge, right? For, for, the, like for, this, for this room of air, there's so many particles hanging around. I don't know every particle's position and velocity. It's too much to handle. But say there were a demon who knew everything about the universe in the sense of who knew every particle's position and velocity. All-encompassing demon has infinite computing power. You know, he runs maybe Google, I don't know, whatever. But that, that demon has access to every particles, x and x dot, at some time. That demon knows everything about the universe that ever will be or that ever has been. Because the laws of physics just tell you what you're supposed to do. If you know where you are, and you know where you're going, F equals MA will tell you what's going to happen next, and so on and so forth, even in the past. So just by the initial conditions for everything in the universe, you can predict with absolute certainty what has happened all across nature from the beginning of time, if there was something like that, all the way into the far future. So Laplace's demon is a captain's idea of specifying initial conditions and determining how equations evolve. Okay, so okay, so I can probably draw a little sketch for this thing. Again, this is just if I draw x as a function of time, this is time. In this language of the equation, um, I am oscillating back and forth like that. My amplitude is this height a tilde. This is the amplitude. Again. And the phase, the phi is the initial phase lag, which with it starts at t equals to zero. So again, I think you've seen this stuff before, so I'm not already you know, picking up on the on the simpler details. If there are questions, please feel free to ask. So let's say pause here for a minute and see what we have done so far. I'm not very happy with how these boards are. This is a new room, and I don't know if you people noticed or not. A few things changed. Uh, but the fact that it will take a little getting used to with the fact that the boards are not visible up there. Sorry about that. I, I get used to it. About it. So will you? Okay. Any questions about this stuff? Just take a be there. See what happened. What's like? Do people use the like first form you listed with the a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t? Because I feel like the second form tells you a lot more information. So then yes. what's the use of the? So this is much more intuitive, as you said, because it tells you amplitude directly tells you the initial phase lag, right? 
But there could be cases where handling individual terms becomes mathematically more easier. So one could imagine doing that. But I think for a more intuitive sake of the, of the form of the equation, definitely this is more, more viable. Anything else? Thoughts, questions? All with me? Sleepy, somewhere? I know it's hard, but you know, life's hard. <laughs> Okay, and how are we doing on time? Not very good. Great. Okay, we can probably cover up. Again, my point today was just to end up, you know, ease you into the course, give you a broader sense, and if I did this, we'd be much more mathematically oriented, do a bunch of more examples, and uh, touch with those concepts. Okay, let's kind of get back. Um, I can set this up, save some time. Okay, um, you also like learn in the course, Okay, how is our math background here? Have we learned complex numbers? Everyone knows what they are, basically, right? Okay, that's good. So I just want to mention that working with trig functions like courses and science can be pretty cumbersome. Because when you try and multiply stuff together, it just gets out of hand. It's like too many terms to handle, right? So we have a little mathematical trick. What we do is we just promote our variable x of t, the x of the particle, to a complex number. It has no physical meaning to it. It's just a mathematical trick. Okay? So what we do is we just promote x of t to a complex number z of t, solve everything as it was. So the equation then becomes z double dot equals minus omega squared z. You solve it, get the answers. But now this is a complex number. And the solutions for that, again, which function differentiated twice or once gives the same function again? Exponentials, right? So z can be, z of t can be um, a to the e to the i omega t minus phi. Again, two unknown constants, a to the i and phi. It's a complex function now. And once you've solved for this, again, finally, just take x of t to be the real part be the real part of z of t, which is again a to the cosine omega t minus y. Why this would help, as you will see in your homeworks and stuff like that, is because when you multiply two exponentials, the arguments add up in the exponential argument. But sine a times sine b is not sine a plus b, but e to the a, e to the b, e to the a plus b. That eases your life massively. So just a mathematical trick going from real to the complex, Doing all the math, coming back to the reals, by taking the real part. This reminds me of a, a joke, which is deeper than a joke. It says that life is complex because it, it has both the real part and an imaginary part. Ooh. <laughs> Stuff, <laughs> eh? <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's that. And anyone know the value of i to the i? That's too egoistic, I guess, i to the i. But what's the value? I have bad jokes, please. Don't don't judge me. What's the value of i to the i? Anyone just know it? Know how to solve it? What's i in terms of exponentials? i is just e to the minus uh, e to the i pi over two. Sine uh, cosine pi over two plus i sine pi over two. Cos pi over two is zero. So this is just i times sine pi over two which is one. So this is e i. Is that okay? We all see it. So this is just e to the i pi over 2 to the power i. Again, bring this in, e to the minus uh, e to the i squared pi over 2. i squared is minus 1, e to the minus pi over 2. Mathematica, plug it in, get a value. This is like 0.28 or something. Just I just want to tell you this. Just guys. All right. Any questions? Complex numbers, um, their expansion, series, truncations, approximations, springs, initial conditions, the demon, anything. Okay, good. All right, so what's the least important word that I have? Probably send this up. The other reason, this was my physics motivation, right? Since force fields like gravity and electrostatics have potential energies, you can always approximate it as parabolas, about local minimas, solve for the equations, it's solvable, get the answers. 
the other more um, important part, or the other important like branch of this this argument, you still might worry that how can the universe be described by just a single frequency, just one omega? Simple sine and cosine. They are boring things. They're important, but they are boring. Nothing ever changes. The other reason, which is which I kind of connects the whole game together, is the fact that these harmonic solutions will be an alphabet for thinking about any possible any possible oscillation and wave. Just like we, we make up words with single letters, right? Each letter is boring, but we can make up words with letters. Similarly, if I have any arbitrary shaped function of function of time, let's say, x of t, let's say it's right, some periodic function. I'm claiming, I'm not deriving, I'm not proving, I'm just claiming that this can schematically be written down as a sum over different frequency values of some particular frequencies, a sine omega t plus b e cos omega t. The point is, once you have individual sines and cosines, you can put them together, one after the other, and form any solution that you want. Now that is a powerful statement. Sines and cosines put together in, in, in cool ways can give you stuff that is happening in the real world. Very complex stuff, real stuff. And this is what is called the Fourier decomposition, which is decomposing a signal into its Fourier modes. Fourier is the word which we use for these sines and cosines. This guy, you must have come up with the idea, I'm sure. And it's some over different omegas. We'll talk about this in detail in the class like week three or week four or something, but the fact that any signal can be decomposed like that. So once you've figured out the physics motivation, you can solve it, just put it together, and everything is working for you, okay? So that's, that's, like, that's like powerful, I want to say. And again, this might seem like some like math voodoo or something. Mm -hmm. Our years use this mechanism to figure out things. A year has this, I don't know, I don't know what, is it a muscle or is it something? Again, I'm not a biologist. If you, some people know it, do, do correct me. There's this little thing in the year called the cock of the eye. It's like this cartilage thing, maybe flesh or whatever, and it has different thicknesses as you go inside the ear. Okay? As sound comes in, different parts of that different thickness cochlea, they respond to different frequencies in this decomposition of the incoming sound wave. And that's what your brain interprets, puts together to think about a sound. So I don't know why, but yeah, math is is real. Even the brain like uses Fourier stuff to kind of like put things together. Again, I guess I heard this. If anyone has more comments, I'm happy to hear about it. Okay. So so now what we'll do is I hope that everyone is now kind of convinced that the next Nine and a half weeks are not going to be a waste of time. Even though we might not learn a new law of nature, we're going to explore such ideas which make up nature in its most uh, basic ideas. So today we discussed simple harmonic motion. We will go on next on Friday to talk about, uh, next week rather, to talk about damped harmonic motion, first harmonic motion, normal modes, and how these things like get together to describe features from waves on, 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 on the water surface, how disks have refraction, those diffraction colors all over the place, and a whole bunch of things. I will also like try um, in the course, have a little demo in class, like using a DVD disk and a little laser. We'll see those little colored patterns and try and work out what the storage of the disk is, just by looking at it. So it's like cool stuff. But no, we're not going yet. If you still have a few more minutes, so please uh, bear with me. I also want to mention that um, this whole thing will like build up. And I'm reminded of like Sidney Coleman, this very famous physicist at Harvard. So he had this quote about the whole idea of oscillation and things. He said that the career of a young theoretical physicist is all about dealing with the harmonic oscillator in ever increasing levels of abstraction. So this is the most basic one. If you keep building upon this, you eventually get to quantum mechanics, Feynman diagrams, 
and hopefully some data quantum guarantee as well. So this stuff does underpin nature in its very, uh, in its very uh, primal form. So I had stuff to talk about more, but I want to kind of open to questions for now. So whatever comes to mind uh, about the physics here, the motivation, course logistics, when's the first homework due, anything which comes to mind. Oh, the whole term vanishes, yes. Oh, okay. But when you... So I just want to convey that this particular piece of the of this multiplication is zero, and hence the whole thing is zero. Oh, okay. So this, of course, this whole thing vanishes. But before we started out, as a data expansion, I didn't know what to do. I just I started off writing every term. And since I was working with the local minima, hence this term vanished. But as a, as a data expansion, it must have this term. It went away because I was looking at this particular term. And of course, this, this number is zero, hence the whole term is zero. <coughs> Any other questions about the expansions, cosine signs, national frequencies, springs, anything? You good? Yeah. What is homework? Excellent. <laughs> um, so the first homework is due next Tuesday at 11. So I'm guessing that should be the, the 8th of October. So it's already online. At, on the website, um, and okay, since we have a, like one more minute to spare, this time since again our, our focus is your learning, we, you have, none of you are like physics majors here, right? So I know your focus is not exactly in this course as as a as one of your courses ideas. We want you to like enjoy and learn stuff along the way. So the point is that, but since homeworks are like, so heavily weighted, seventy percent, what we want you to do is when you do your homeworks, don't just plug and chug. Don't just put an equation and write the answer. That's not what we want you to learn here. We want to like, think like physicists. It helps, to be honest. Start with the assumptions, what the assumptions are. Have a diagram. Mention the units. Have a proper graph. Have it labeled. Uh, equations, if you can derive it shortly, derive it. Mention references. Have a wholesome homework. Don't just say, OK, find the natural frequency. Yeah. Omega is K over M. Done. That's the answer we get it. You guys are smart. But again, the point of this is not to just get to the right numerical value. It's about how to think in a way in which you're logical, rational, and you approach it to and like get something out of it. So homeworks, your first problem is about reading a, a small document. And you have to just say, I read it. That's five points. Thank you. You're welcome. I know. You're good people. <laughs> so do that and just like learn from that document on how to proceed with other homeworks. It's, it's a very good outline. And I recommend you using that in the homeworks for this course and outside as well. And again, if you have questions, we have office hours, we have other recitations, the lectures, uh, feel free to bug me. And I'll just like close by saying if people in this room right now, not in section one, officially on the list, but are going to come in here, please give me the addresses that will put in the email. So thank you all for coming on the first day. See you guys Friday.